What is going on, everyone? Welcome back into the 415ers podcast, three times a week. Odyssey Sports Podcast Network, 95.7 The Game. Evan Giddings, Mark Randy, Mark, my man, how are you? I'm doing well, Evan. Happy New Year, celebrating 2023 with another Niners win. They're ninth in a row in overtime this time. Uh, it's a good start to the year. How are you doing in 2023, Evan? I'm good. Yeah, we just watched the best game of 2023, Mark. <laughs> okay, that joke is already old. Uh, I hadn't seen it. I'm not really a big social media guy, so <laughs> I hadn't seen it yet. I'm sure you have millions of times. Few people have as well. But in all honesty, like this was probably this was the most entertaining game that the Four Niners have played this season, in my opinion. 37-34 OT win for the Niners. It was a lot of different things that we're going to break down over these 45 minutes. Uh, we're also going to get into some of the costs of this game and a few injuries yeah. that could be. Um, significant moving forward for the 49ers. But the fact of the matter is San Francisco is the two seed. Mark's prediction from yesterday year has come true with the Minnesota Vikings getting their asses kicked by the Green Bay Packers today in Lambeau. And Mark, I'll, I'll let you first, before we dive into the game, take your victory lap because whether you like it or not, whether you like the win, uh, the slight victory, whatever, they are the two seed. Well, I, I don't think it's fair for me to victory lap yet because my prediction was they'd go into the playoffs as the two seed. There's still a week of football left. Now, come on. Uh, now, it seems likely they'll be the two seed. We can talk more about this maybe towards the end of the episode or, or later on this week, certainly when we start diving into week 18. Um, the Niners should beat the Cardinals, who are waving the white flag on a terrible season already. Niners have a relative, uh, you know, still a lot to play for. Uh, so they should be motivated to win that game. Plus, it's at home, all that. If the Niners, the only way the Niners get the three seed is if they lose and Minnesota wins. So if if the Niners win, Minnesota wins, Niners are still the two. If Minnesota loses, Niners lose, the Niners are still the two. Uh, so it seems likely that the Niners will be the two seed. The one seed, though, is still possible. I'm not going to victory lap yet. My prediction was they'll go into the playoffs as the two seed. We took a giant step forward to that on, on this Sunday, week 17, the 1st of January, Evan. But we're not there just yet. So we? we'll maybe save it. We'll, yeah, me and you going on this journey together. We're not there yet. Uh, we'll, we'll save that victory lap for maybe seven more days. Okay, sounds good. We'll, we'll put a bookmark in it. Yes. Let's get back to the game because I do. And this is where I want to start, Mark. Certainly a win. Some might say it's a, you know, could have been a loss. You should have beat the Raiders. You're a 10 point favorite. Come on. What are you doing? It's in Las Vegas. The Raiders are probably out partying last night. Who knows if the, if the Fort Niners were too. I know I tweeted out during the game. It looked like in the first half, the Fort Niners were out, were out partying last night. But the fact of the matter is this this was a valuable win for the 49ers, in my opinion, because the one thing we had not seen yet in a Brock Purdy led 49ers team and really throughout this entire season, was then be able to pull out a victory when the game was in the balance. Now, they have won single-score games. They are now 3-1 and one in those scenarios. But in a game in which you're down to a final couple of drives, you got a 10-point deficit in the second half, you're on the road. I know it wasn't necessarily hostile environment because it looked like there was a lot of 49ers fans, maybe even more than 50% compared to Raider fans at Allegiant Stadium, but you're on the road yeah. and you got a rookie quarterback and he still has a box left to check off, which is, can he lead you back when he needs you to? And whatever you want to say about the Raiders, they played their ass off on Sunday and Brock Purdy and the offense found a way on a day in which the defense was not at its best to win a close game in overtime in which they easily could have mailed it in and said, hey, we'll fight for the two seed next week. It doesn't matter. They wanted to win this game. In a lot of ways, I think they should have won this game, and they did. And that is why, to me, even though it's not a good win, definitely not a great win, it's a valuable win specifically for Brock Purdy and for the overall 49ers now who move into the two seed. I think you're right, calling it a valuable win. Um, something we talked about leading into this game on our last episode uh, on Friday was every rep is still important for Brock Purdy at this point. It really does not matter who they're playing against. You could be playing against you know, the worst team in the league. 
it's still valuable because the 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 sample size of Brock Purdy at this level is still so small. Every snap he takes, every throw he makes, really every handoff he makes, it's still a learning experience for him. So you you kind of double that when you think about the fact that he had to come from behind in this game. The first time that he's trailed as a starter. Entering this game, the only other time he had trailed was when he came in in relief of Jimmy Garoppolo after he went down early in that game against the Dolphins when Trent Sherfield got the Dolphins on the board early with that first play from scrimmage touchdown. That was the only time the Niners had trailed with Brock Purdy at the helm of this team. So suddenly you go down by 10 points into halftime and you're thinking, okay, we're going to see what Brock Purdy is made of. You fast forward to towards the end of regulation, a tie game. Brock Purdy gets the ball with four minutes left. Now, it's not like he made perfect throw after perfect throw. It was a big play to Christian McCaffrey on a screen. By the way, great call by Kyle Shanahan. Pulled it out at the exact right moment against an all-out blitz by the by the Raiders. But the Niners go all the way down. They score a touchdown. Now, unfortunately, the defense allows Devontae Adams and Josh Jacobs and company to score again as well. You tie up the game. You give the ball back to Brock Purdy with about a minute left. Guess what? He goes down and with the help of some spectacular Brandon Ayuk play, gets you into field goal range again. I mean, Brock Purdy led you on two game-winning drives in the final four minutes of that game. Now, of course, the missed field goal sent the game into overtime, but he twice led you down in must-have situations and put you in position to score. You scored once, you missed a field goal the second time. So I'm with you, Evan. Valuable for the 49ers to prove to themselves they can win a game like this when their defense isn't up to their extremely high standards, but more specifically for Brock Purdy, we learned a lot about him in this game. There were some moments in this game where he was a little off balance. His interception on that pass to George Kittle was straight up a bad throw. Yeah, maybe George Kittle could have knocked the ball away, done a bit better there playing defensive back on that wayward throw, but it was not a good throw by Brock Purdy. But when it mattered the most, Evan, Brock Purdy stepped up and he showed the 49ers that this isn't just some mirage. He can lead this team to a Super Bowl. I know the Raiders are not the stiffest competition defensively, but to do it in that moment, in that environment, late in the fourth quarter, I don't care who you're going against. It's meaningful. Yeah, look, Brock Purdy today, he had to throw the ball in the second half. I think he only had 38 yards passing, although he had both (laughs) of his touchdowns in the first half. But he had about 250 yards in the second half. I mean, that's nothing to scoff at. So if you're looking at a two, a 22 for 35 line, you know, 284, two touchdowns, a pick, the bad throw, like you said, to Kittle, um, and we can get into some of the mistakes, surely, uh, as well as some stuff that we can critique. I think mainly the fingers are pointed at the defense, maybe a couple of questionable calls by Kyle Shanahan, in my opinion, that I'll I'll get into. Uh, But the offense was not the issue today. And this was, Look, kind of a question about the 49ers with Jimmy Garoppolo and especially with Trey Lance. It's like, okay, when the defense has a bad day, what are you going to do? And so I think that even if it's the Las Vegas Raiders on the other side, give them credit. Like they showed up today with a backup quarterback and a situation in which technically their season is still alive. Like that's why we were talking about leading in this week, why it was it felt like a slap in the face of Derek Carr to tell him to hit the pike. <laughs> Jared Stidham stood up to the 49ers' number one defense and I think exposed them a little bit, which we can break down. But first and foremost, the credit goes to the offense and it goes to Brock Purdy to be able to churn out seven and a half thereabouts yards per play, 284 through the air, yes, but 170 on the ground and 183 com- or not 193 combined yards between pass, uh, catch and run between uh, for Christian McCaffrey, pardon me. So there was a lot to love about this game. And offensively, it starts with Brock Purdy. The other reason why I think that it's a valuable experience for Purdy is I I don't know if we necessarily saw anything we didn't know about Brock. Like, I I think he is very much a a gunslinging quarterback, both good and bad. But I think that this is a valuable experience because when you go into the postseason and you get into a situation where, like you said, you're in a maybe not a game-winning drive at the time, but a gotta-have-it drive. Okay, now he's got something in the back of his mind where he can go to and say, like, today, it was a situation where 
all right, I don't know any better. I'm just going to go out there and, and let it rip. Okay, well, now he's got something tangible that he can tap into in a future scenario and say, number one, I've succeeded in that spot before. So he's got even more confidence that he already apparently has. Two, he has some reference point to, all right, what did I do well in my last game-winning potential drive? And what did I do bad? Where did I put us in a position to where we were going to win, to where we're trying to win? But also, where did I put us in a position where we could have been hurt, where I could have turned the ball over, like a play on you know, the play-action rollout right before the missed field goal before the end of the game, where he... I'm not going to blame him for that because it's more on Shanahan, in my opinion. But that's a play where he's trying to do a little bit too much and almost turns over the football. Thankfully, yeah. it ends up in the arms of Ayuk. But that's a, a a maybe miss or make play that the 49ers get. So I think that it's valuable there as well for a guy like Brock Purdy. I think if if you're Kyle Shanahan, and he would never openly admit this, but you're coming into this game, Week 17, you have the division already wrapped up. Yes, you're still hoping for the two seed and an outside chance at the one seed. If you could promise him that you come out of Las Vegas with a win, you could promise him that it was a win, regardless of what happened. I think he would draw up a game similar to how this one went as his ideal result. You know what I mean? A a Hmm. game in which they, they struggled defensively, a game in which the offense needed to go out and get it, a game in which they were behind early. They were down by 10 points at halftime. We talked a lot early in the season. That was an area that the 49ers under Kyle Shanahan have really, really struggled in in Shanahan's tenure. Guarantee a win. You would love to see this team lean on the offense for a change and go out and get a win. Now, you know, the one aside there is you also want to hope you come out with no major injuries, and it's still TBD on that front. A couple of guys go down. Aaron Banks, your left guard. Dre Greenlaw, your potentially all-pro linebacker. There'll be more tests on Monday. We're recording this here Sunday evening. We will know more next episode, but that's the big TBD there. But beside that, Evan, you come out with a win, Your team comes from behind. You saw your young rookie quarterback make big throws time after time in big moments, and you did not need your defense to be incredible to win a game on the road. I think ultimately, forget about the injuries for a second, ultimately a fantastic result for the 49ers that should give them more confidence in themselves as they try to make a run to the Super Bowl. I also think that there is room for criticism, even with Brock Purdy. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like he played a perfect game because he didn't. Because to me, there were a couple of there were a couple of throws that if Jimmy Garoppolo makes or another quarterback for the 49ers makes, we are coming down their road a bit. I mean, sure, the interception of Kittle to me was a mistake, and it was a mistake for a, a couple of reasons. One I think Brock Purdy's arm strength or lack of showed a little bit in this game because that's a throw that either one, you need a bazooka to make two, you got to make that throw earlier across the middle of the field or three, you got to put it in your back pocket. And Brock Purdy did none of those three things. So that's why that play turned into an interception. I also think down near the goal line where he tried to fit that ball into a tight window to George Kittle that was batted down. That's a throw that if it's a little to the right, a little to the left, not only is a pick, but potentially is taken back the other way for six. That's a dangerous throw that you need, again, to have more zip on that ball, which I don't know if Brock Purdy has to be able to make. The other part of it, too, is, you know, there there were a couple of times where he, he missed a read. George Kittle over the middle, you know, he instead tried to go out to McCaffrey and he found him. But that was a play that could have been had down the middle. There were missed opportunities by Brock Purdy, but we learned again that he is able to overcome adversity and flush all of these mistakes that he makes. The only question is, okay, well, if you do it in a playoff scenario, is that going to hurt you more than it does against the Las Vegas Raiders? Because in this game, the difference was a turnover. The difference was Jared Stidham via Nick Bosa creating a turnover to Deshaun Gibson at the end of over or beginning of overtime that then turns into a 23 yard field goal for Robbie gold in the win. If that turnover doesn't happen, who's to say Jared Stidham doesn't go down and score and win the game. 
So if the 49ers are winning the turnover battle, in my opinion, they're more than likely to win the game. The only thing that I would be a little bit hesitant about is some of those aggressive gunslinging, you know, effort sometimes throws that Brock Purdy will make that so far have been, you know, very advantageous that have helped the 49ers and he should be given credit for. I just hope that he doesn't take today as, oh, well, now I have more free reign to do more of that. And I, I don't think it will be, but I do think that's something interesting to keep an eye on moving forward because he's gotten away with some of those tougher throws where you're trying to fit it into a really tight window. You mentioned the one to Kittle at the goal line where he was trying to fit it between two converging defenders and ultimately he got it between them, but it was such a tight window. He couldn't get it completed. It falls incomplete, but but again, that, that could have easily been an interception. On that play though, if you remember... Uh, it was there were there were two other receivers to the left side of the formation, Juwan Jennings on the goal line, and Ray Ray McLeod was running a deeper route in the back left corner of the end zone. And there was only one cornerback on that side of the field. Everyone else was drawn up to Kittle because they they know that he's one of Brock Purdy's favorite targets. I mean, after having a relatively slow start to the season, Kittle is now having a career year, at least touchdown wise, and a big part of that is Brock Purdy. So there was so much focus on George Kittle that there were two Niner receivers, Jawan Jennings and Ray Ray McLeod, on the left side of the end zone being covered by one cornerback. That cornerback chose to run up and cover Jawan Jennings at the goal line, leaving Ray Ray McLeod wide open in the back left corner. Now, it would have taken a nice touch pass over the top of that corner to get it to Ray Ray, but he was still wide open, standing all by himself in that back left corner of the end zone. I don't think Brock Purdy ever saw him. So to your point, as we see more and more tape on Brock Purdy, we are seeing that he's not perfect. And that's not a knock on him. No quarterback is perfect. But there are some throws. The, the one to Kittle may be a bad decision uh, at the goal line. The interception on the pass intended to Kittle maybe shows off uh, his lack of arm strength, at least elite arm strength. But there are also examples of him simply not seeing open receivers. Now, that happens for every quarterback. I'm not saying this is the end of the world. Just pointing it out that he is missing some guys as well. The one thing I will say, though, Evan, about Brock Purdy, generally when he releases the ball and it's within, I don't know, 15 to 20 yards of the line of scrimmage, he's extremely accurate. Uh, he, he puts it where he wants it. Now, it's when... You have those throws further down the field where things maybe get a little bit shaky. That interception to Kittle is an example. But if you're within 15 yards of the line of scrimmage, Evan, he's going to put it on you for the most part. And, and he showed that again here, but there are still some moments where either he's not seeing the guy he should throw it to, or maybe he's trusting his arm strength a little bit too much and that's getting him into trouble. But still, overall, a positive day for Purdy. Yeah, and look, he was... he. Found some touch on the, I believe, second touchdown, which he found George Kittle in the back of it's the end zone. Play. You know, great play. Rolling out to his left, putting it over the top of not only a couple of his own guys, but a couple of defenders reaching up for the ball. George Kittle, it looked like he saw him kind of sliding along with the quarterback towards the corner, finds yeah. him for the two-yard score. That That's a great play by, by Brock Purdy. So, you know, for those that, that kind of feel like I might be nitpicking, I do want to give him credit for the plays that he did make. Oh, I'm, um, I'm, yeah, I'm with you 100. percent I mean, he, he was good. I, one interception. Uh, again, it, it wasn't a, a very good throw, but he throws for almost 300 yards. He has two touchdowns in every game he's played for the 49ers. Longest streak uh, for a Niners quarterback throwing for at least two touchdowns since 2001, when Jeff Garcia did it in eight straight games. Purdy's now done it in five straight games. Um, he does something every week that that kind of makes. Uh, you go, wow, that, that touchdown to George Kittle was the one where it happened for me today. Um, and he's just a rookie, so he's only going to get better. But uh, we wouldn't be doing his performance justice if we weren't looking at areas in which he could still get better. And as a rookie, that's going to be natural. And Kyle Shanahan knows that as well. So I'm with you. We're not knocking Brock Purdy. This, this stuff is expected. I mean, he's a seventh-round rookie quarterback. He's going to get better. He's not going to be perfect right now but you try to identify where he can get better and, and that might speed along the process of him improving. Yeah. Uh, one note about that before we move on, Mark, I believe the five straight games to start a career with two touchdowns or more, the second, second best streak ever 
to Justin Herbert, who did it eight times in 2020. So, you know, if you're looking at that as a measuring stick, that's a pretty yeah. good start for a young quarterback.